Hello, everybody. Welcome to day three of our Transforming Communities, a Movement to Racial Justice event. I appreciate you all taking the time to be here with us. My name is Jamal Williams. I serve as the Director of Advocacy for Racial Justice at San Jose State University. We started this series as a way to bridge community and, and our campus at San Jose State. We wanted to continue the conversation that was, that was sparked last year uh, during a tumultuous year uh, of, 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 of racial, inju racial injustice, <laughs> racial reconciliation, um, and a movement for liberation on behalf of communities who have been uh, oppressed and marginalized, uh, stemming from the, the lives taken from the Black community. And we didn't want the, to let that conversation die. And uh, transforming communities, a movement to racial justice, is that, is this, is our attempt and is our strategy at San Jose State to make sure that we are continuing to be a part of this conversation, to, to use our, our, our voices, to use our space, and to recognize that in, in San Jose and in Santa Clara County, we owe it to our, 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 our community to make sure we're part of, of the movement forward. Before we get started tonight, before we welcome our wonderful uh, keynote guest, Ms. Kaya McCullough, um, I wanted to take time to read a land acknowledgement. Uh, the land acknowledgement should be up on the screen. And as well, if you go to your settings, um, you go to your settings and you can turn on the closed captioning. Uh, so I wanna make sure everybody uh, everybody can hear us. This, this land acknowledgement uh, shared from the Mowek Maloney tribe, um, we want to make sure that we're honoring, uh, is, is, is especially important um, given that we're in Native American Heritage Month throughout the entire month of November. We would like to begin this program by recognizing that while we gather at San Jose State University or wherever you all are, observing the program from. We are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Tami and Ohlone, who are direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into the mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established was and continues to be of significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Moek Maloney constructed and maintained three Bay Area missions. Our campus extends to the surrounding areas that held the Tupintoc, which is a traditional roundhouse, which were once located at the historic Lope Inigo's land grant rancho Posomi y Positas de las Animas, Little Wells of Souls. And also Marcelo, Pio, and Cristobal's land grant rancho Ulista which were places of celebration and religious ceremony, as well as nearby ancestral heritage shell mounds that served as the tribe's traditional cemetery sites and territorial monuments. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Muwekma men and women who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and who are still serving in the United States Army today. All right, now we get to move on to our program. I want to take this time now to introduce our wonderful uh, moderators for today. All right, our first moderator Dr. Akila Carter Francique is the executive director of the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change, the ISSSC at San Jose State University. She is also an associate professor at SGSU in the Department of African American Studies. Her scholarly endeavors and field of focus encompasses the intersection of sports, society, and social justice that is inclusive of issues of diversity, social movements, and the dynamics of social change and development. Carter Francique served as the 2018-2019 president of the North American Society 
for the Soci Sociology of Sport, NASSS. She currently serves as a member of Laureus Sport for Good Research Council in the United States. And, and she is the co-editor of Athletic Experience at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Past, Present, and Persistence and Critical Race Theory. And Critical Race Theory, Black Athletic Experiences in the United States. Our second moderator will be Caleb Simmons. Caleb is a fourth year kinesiology major at San Jose State University. Simmons from Vallejo, California is a member of the SJSU basketball team and utilize his athletic platform to address and support issues in college athletics and the broader society. At SJSU, he has served for three years on the Student Athlete Advisory Committee Executive Board as their chair for community outreach. This engagement led to serving the 2020-2021 Mountain West Conference, SAAC, where he supported the launch of the first Student Athlete Social Justice Committee. Simmons is a founding member and affiliate of Athletes for Changes, a social change organization comprised of college athletes across the United States who desire to make a difference in the world. Athletes for Changes utilizes social media as a platform to share information and promote awareness, which was achieved through their summer 2020 Instagram campaign that raised $78,000 for the Black Lives Matter movement in one week. In these times of COVID-19, Simmons led protests in Arizona and California in 2020 prior to starting his fall academic year of 2020. His hunger for social change led him to serve as an interim for SJSU Institute for the Study of Sports Society and Social, an intern for the SJSU's Institute for the Study of Sports Society and Social Change during the fall semester. Simmons' passion for change and equity provides him an opportunity to share his message across various media outlets in Arizona and California, most notably his segment on NBC Bay Area's race in America. Please welcome Akila Carter, Dr. Akila carter Francie as she kicks off this event. Thank you, Jamal Williams, for the energy, for um, even hosting this, this transformational two weeks that we are having here at San Jose State University. It's a phenomenal time. I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, so again, I just thank you for the opportunity uh, for uh, a word from the Institute and the opportunity to share this, this amazing conversation with our keynote panelist, uh, Kaya McCullough. But I wanted to say, you know, first and foremost, from the Institute for Sports, Society, and Social Change, if you're not familiar with it, to know that the Institute started in the uh, spring of 2017 as the brainchild of Dr. Harry Edwards, the architect uh, for the Olympic Project of Human Rights. He, along with many others, uh, had uh, in 1968, again, laid the foundation and had that opportunity to uh, come together to speak up for and, and, and not only speak up, but really work together to bring a collective community together to speak up and use their platform of sport to speak to social change. And so we know this by the 1968 Olympics and the 200 meter, uh, men's 200 meter with Tommy Smith and John Carlos atop the podium in their first and third place spaces. But those athletes were here at San Jose State University and came together again to raise a black glove fist to stand up for social change. And along with them in alliance was Peter Norman, the second place winner from Australia who stood in solidarity. So again, I welcome each and every one of you here that have perhaps experienced social and racial injustice. And then those that are here as allies to stand up for, for social change and support us in this transformational uh, two weeks of experience, conversation and efforts to promote change. So with that said, I wanna get us started into our conversation uh, and uh, allow me to introduce our amazing, amazing guest today. Kaya McCullough, an activist and former professional soccer player. She spent, through, um, she spent time playing in the National Women's Soccer League and two from Bundesliga after a four-year career at UCLA and their elite women's soccer program. While at UCLA, she received the Pac-12 Scholar Athlete of the Year Award for women's soccer and was one of the first, the first collegiate athletes to kneel for the national anthem. Inspired by Colin Kaepernick and Megan Rapinoe, 
She currently is the chairwoman for Anti-Racist Soccer Club, a coalition fighting against racism in the American soccer landscape, and a co-founder of United College Athletes Association, an organization working to ensure college athletes are protected, educated, and compensated. She is fiercely passionate about many social justice causes, especially in the intersections of racial justice, and is currently in the process, and I would say of applying to law school, but I think she got in, right? So we'll have those conversations today to hear more about her journey and her experience. So before we go into that, we've got a little something to share. So if you're not familiar with her to learn a little bit more about who Kaya McCullough is. And just possess in the end, McCullough. That was a terrific run by Kaya McCullough. And runs right into McCullough. Solid blocking of the lanes there. No channels. Hooked off. Oh, McCullough. Big close oh, by McCullough. Big, big close by McCullough. Here comes Kaya McCullough with pressure behind. McCullough's shot! And a score, and we're tied at one. Kaya McCullough. So I want to welcome Kaya McCullough to the platform. Uh, we're going to have a little conversation uh, this evening. Good evening, good evening. It is so, so good to meet you and to talk to you. And I'm so thrilled that you're here um, and uh, hoping to learn a little bit more about you. We're gonna have some segments and really focus on the theme of this next two weeks when we talk about transforming communities, focusing on reflection, focusing on discovery, and then focusing on the action, the action of the activism that you've been participating in. So with that, I'll go ahead and start out. I mean, that what an amazing video. Everyone <laughs> just got to give her props, give her flowers already. I mean, a force to be reckoned with. I'm, I'm so excited. As a former student athlete myself, I was not a soccer player, um, but track and field, uh, but definitely showed some skill and talent there. So talk to our audience. Tell us who you are, where did you grow up? What was life like for you? <laughs> yes, hello everybody. Just wanna say first, thanks all for being here. Thank you guys for having me. Um, seeing those clips was funny. I haven't seen my highlight reel in a little bit. So that was a nice little start to the evening for me. But who am I? My name is Kaya McCullough. I am 23 years old. I am a biracial black woman, former professional soccer player, as you saw. Um, but I'm so much more than that now. And I grew up in Orange County, California. I'm still there currently as I'm working and coaching and applying for law school, as was mentioned before. But I really am just somebody who wants to make a difference in the world. And I think we're going to talk about that today. And I'm just super excited to share my story with you all. Great. Oh my gosh. So I want you to kind of, we're going to walk a little bit down memory lane and get into that college experience. Again, we're here at San Jose State University and a number of student athletes. Um, I had an opportunity to, to speak with a couple of weeks ago um, with a conference that we held, but they're in season right now. They're back um, because we've been in COVID times, <laughs> definitely in those COVID times. And so um, they're just now able to be back on campus and getting involved in the game again. So for, for, for those of us, again, that don't know much about the college soccer game or football, if you're from other countries, right? Can you walk us through your college athletic experience or give us a brief sort of understanding of what life was like for you um, and what some of the, the highs were of your experience to include academics, to include athletics and even social engagement? Yeah, so I like to always say that my experience as a Bruin student athlete began before I was even born. Both my parents were student athletes at UCLA. 
that's where they met. And I like to attribute that to part of the reason that I'm even alive. So when I was able to start my own journey towards becoming a college athlete, it really seemed fitting that UCLA was the best choice for me. And it ended up being some of the best four years of my life. And honestly, some of the most transformative four years of my life. Um, I had a great experience as a student athlete. I felt really supported by my university. I managed a very, very busy college schedule. I took a full course load. Um, I ended up switching majors when I was a junior in college. So had to take, you know, a lot of extra classes, always there in the summer training, always taking summer classes, which were like accelerated for the UC system and always traveling. Um, in terms of the actual soccer career, I felt like I developed so much as a player and as a person on the soccer field. I played in every or I started every single game I ever played in. I only never played in one game because I accidentally got sick <laughs> before a big game, but I was lucky and blessed to be able to make a huge impact on the field and off the field with my team and in the student athlete community at UCLA. So I think overall, I had a really amazing experience. I don't think I would change much about it. Um, I felt really supported by my university, by my coaches, by my teammates, and I attribute a lot of my success now to some of the more formative experiences I had while I was at UCLA. Thank you so much. You, you were actually, I was walking through my own experience as well and just sort of remembering I was in school a little bit longer ago, <laughs> a few moons ago. But with that said, and we, you know, we read your, your bio, such rich accolades in there, um, but the bio stated, you know, you were one of the first to kneel in alliance with Colin Kaepernick. So, you know, want to kind of know from you, what, what compelled you to kneel? What was, what was going on for you? Yeah, so I'd say my, my journey into social justice probably started a little bit before college, so I'll rewind a little bit. I had stopped saying the Pledge of Allegiance in high school when I was about a junior. I, you know, saw what was going on in Ferguson. It was around that time I was in high school, and I saw a lot of the police brutality that was happening around us. Not that it was new, but it was just starting to come to the forefront of my consciousness and so that was really when I started kind of thinking critically about the systems that we lived in and my role in society and how I fit in as a biracial black woman, um, especially in an environment like Orange County. And that was kind of my first iteration of protest was refusing to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And that was met with a little bit of, um, you know, conflict. I had people who, you know, would say things like go back to Africa if you're not really happy with with uh, the way things are in America. So I think that was kind of the beginning spark of my path into the social justice space and activism as it is now. Um, but once I got to UCLA, I think my freshman year, I was very focused on adjusting to that schedule and that life of being a student athlete. I don't think it, I was as engaged as I could have been um, in social issues. That was the year that Trump got elected to the presidency. And obviously that was a very tumultuous year in and of itself. I went, I think my freshman year was my first season was fall of 2016. So very, you know, pivotal year when you look at it in the grand scheme of the American sociopolitical landscape. Um, but I was just trying to survive as a person and as a player and as a student and kind of figure out my place on the team and in the school and in my community. So it wasn't until my sophomore year that I felt I had the strength and the, I won't say desire because the desire was there, but I just felt very, very, very compelled my sophomore year, actually after a specific incident. I remember, I don't remember exactly what video I saw, but I'm very active on Twitter and, and I had seen, you know, some video of an unarmed black child being murdered by a police officer. And I remember just breaking down in tears and feeling, I can only call it like, so I, I literally felt it in my gut. It was just this kind of warning signal to me. And I, it was like alarm bells kind of went off on my head and I was just, you know, I need to kneel. That was right around the time when 
the controversy with Colin Kaepernick starting to kneel again was picking up in the news cycle and in the media. So it kind of was at the forefront of everybody's not mind, that conversation. And I just felt drawn to it. And I immediately called my mom and I was like, Hey, I think I'm going to kneel. And I know that this is a, a really big thing and it could have some consequences for me, but I'm going to do it. And right after I called my mom, I called my coaches and I was like, Hey, I need to talk to you guys about something. And from there, you know, that that's how it began from there. It kind of took off and to see the way that it snowballed to where I am now is really surreal for me still, but it really just started off of me feeling so angered and sad and horrified by the treatment of you know, my community and black people by the police. So. Whew, that's a lot. Yeah. That's you know, a that's a lot to, to take in and be able to uh, sort of think about it and, 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 and put it in such a way that it made you, it compelled you to want to take action. Um, and a lot at, uh, you know, I think of a young age, again, Smith and Carlos, you know, were, were young in their years as well and sort of coming into this, this reality. Uh, so it, to understand a little bit more, I want to unpack a little bit of that and try to understand, you know, what does it mean? Again, you knelt in alliance with Colin Kaepernick. And we oftentimes hear in the media that, again, our Black men are making those sacrifices. They're kneeling, um, they're protesting, they're, they're taking those steps to um, you know, stand up and speak up for social change. But as a self-identified biracial Black woman, you know, a woman of color, what did it mean to you in that respect to, to stand up and to use your platform for social change? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, too, because that kind of goes into some of the dynamics of, you know, gender equity in sports and how I recognize that soccer or college soccer especially may not have been as recognizable as say the NFL and the mm -hmm. platform may not have been to the same extent, but still there were thousands of fans that were coming to each game. And I knew that even if it could have the impact on one person, um, you know, spark some sort of conversation with just one other person. I, I thought in my mind that it was worth it. And, you know, I think, reflecting back now and kind of recognizing these historical patterns of just how much the burden of social change falls on women of color, especially black women. Um, at the time it was, it wasn't something that I was thinking about in those terms, but now I, I realize the impact of that. And I kind of just see it as this really powerful acknowledgement of that burden that oftentimes black women especially in this country are forced to carry and you know I I honestly was thinking about it in terms of just you know I have a platform I need to do something I was tired of not doing anything or you know I could share things on social media and I could you know have conversations with people in my life but I wanted to do something that was a lot more actionable and I think my I realized that the privilege that I had in being a student athlete at a very recognizable university and, you know, being a biracial black woman, somebody who is oftentimes more palatable um, mm. to white people, especially people perceive me as what, you know, an approachable black person may be. I, I knew that I was in a position to leverage privilege in order to spark a more important conversation. So that's kind of, I don't know if that answers directly your question, but that was, that. those were some of the thoughts that I had when I was kneeling. No, you answer beautifully. You answer beautifully. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I want to bring on one of our very own, you know, athletes that's been at this university, um, taking strides, uh, showing and demonstrating his leadership. 
Uh, again, we, we heard the introduction of Caleb Simmons. And, and again, I would have to say I'm a proud, proud director of the Institute as he joined with us last year to serve as one of the interns for Institute. But since then, you know, has continued to blossom and in many respects, take that effort, um, take that knowledge and step into the space of social um, change and sport activism. So with that said, I'm gonna lead, let him lead us into the next question. Right on, thank you for the amazing introduction. <laughs> I, it's wonderful to meet you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. But the question I wanna start with is how did your, like how were you treated after you took the knee? Like, how were you treated on campus? by your peers, by people that don't even know you, you know, just in the common day to day, how was that? Yeah, I, you know, going into it, I, I really wasn't sure what the reaction was gonna be. And that was some of the fear that I had going into that initial, you know, first time kneeling. I knew it was something that was very con controversial at the time. And I knew that I was kind of putting myself into a position of being scrutinized. Um, I would say overall, the people who mattered to me the most were very, very supportive of what I was doing and were very, very proud of me. And so in the grand scheme of things, I felt nothing but support and love. You know, I had my teammates who, you know, ultimately, ultimately were showing acts of solidarity with me. I had many who kneeled with me, others who, you know, at least showed some sort of support. My coaches were, you know, some of the people who were able to encourage me to even take that step. My family was so proud of me. My close friends were very proud of me. And, you know, the UCLA community as a whole, the athletic department fans in general were very, very supportive. And I can recognize that, you know, my action of kneeling was probably received a lot differently just based on the fact that I was located in Los Angeles. And that's a much more liberal area. Um, I may not have had the same reaction if I were somewhere in the South or somewhere where there was a lot more racial tension than, I mean, not that there isn't in Los Angeles, there's obviously issues, but in general, um, the community that I was in, I think was very supportive. On the other hand, I think that my very decisive and just out there action and just taking a very firm stance, I think kneeling is or it was at the time, uh, again, a very controversial thing. And it really put you on one side of the line or the other. I think that action alienated a few people in my life and made me evaluate certain relationships that I had. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, the people who mattered to me supported me. And there was also the occasional troll on social media, and I still get them to this day. Um, I know that there was some comments that spewed a lot of hate I remember it was featured on some like TMZ article or something after one of the games that we did. So there definitely were instances of hate, but I think overwhelmingly I was met with a lot of support and love. Well, that's awesome. Great, great. Well, you know, I want to kind of bring us up to speed because you've, you've been back in the news <laughs> over yes. the past few weeks. Again, for those that that aren't familiar. I want you to share a little bit again as a as a former um, professional soccer player. Talk a little bit about your experience in the National Women's Soccer League, um, particularly with the Washington Spirit, and 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 share with our audience and give them an understanding of some of the the situation that took place. Um, and again, as much as you want, because I know it was was one of those situations that was not positive. Um, but I think, uh, again, we can all learn from, from your story and what you're, you're willing to share. No, yeah, definitely. I feel like I've, I've done a lot of hard work in the past year to be able to get to the point of even speaking about this stuff. So I'm happy to share my story in the hopes that it will prevent things like this from happening again in the future. So, um, you know, I played for the Washington Spirit in the NWSL. I was drafted in February of 2020, no, January 2020 last year. Joined the team February 2020. And right before the world shut down with the COVID pandemic, I was, you know, that was my first year as a professional player. I didn't really know any better. I was a rookie. I had just moved across the country, was getting used to the life of a, being a professional athlete was getting used to the different weather and being away from my support network. And 
ultimately I was put in a position where I was being psychologically, emotionally, verbally abused by my coach. And it wasn't just me. It was this culture of abuse um, that targeted a lot of people on the team that I was on. And on top of that, there were several racial incidents that were very harmful um, and racist. And, you know, at the time I, I kind of was in survival mode and just trying to get through to the next day. But eventually my joy for the sport that I had played for 18 years up to that point kind of drained out of me. And I decided to remove myself from the situation. And that's when I ended up moving to Germany in September of 2020 last year um, to try and salvage any sort of joy that I still had for the sport. And ultimately I, I wasn't able to do that. I was in a bad club environment there just in terms of, you know, working conditions and not really up to the standards that I had expected. And then on top of, you know, the entire country going into lockdown and it really made me depressed. And I decided that it was probably time for me to pack up my boots and prioritize, prioritize myself and my mental health better. Um, in terms of why I'm in the news now, it's because I recently went on the record for a Washington Post article outlining the abuse I faced, uh, kind of making me a whistleblower. I didn't really have that on my bingo card uh, for my life, being a whistleblower, but here we are, and um, things have definitely kind of spiraled, not out of control, but have spiraled in a way that is creating a lot of change in my former league and across the soccer world in general, especially the women's game. So that's where I am now. That was my experience playing professionally. It wasn't, you know, the greatest experience, but I wouldn't trade it because I am here now and I'm stronger for it. And it put me on a path that I needed to be on. So. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Right on. So the next question I'd like to ask is what role did the media and social media play in amplifying your experience and the experiences of other women, or women athletes? Yeah, in that situation, especially, I don't know that I would have ever spoken up about what happened to me. I kind of wanted to move on from it, package it away, lock it up, throw away the key and just not touch it until I wrote a memoir when I was 57 and, you know, had already established my career. I wanted to move on from the situation. Um, but then an incident happened with my former team and a really wonderful reporter, Molly, approached me and asked to just talk about, you know, some of my experiences and if I could lend light on the situation and just add my perspective. And that initial conversation ended up turning into the article that was released in August and ended up being, you know, the, the kind of piece that broke the whole system. So I think without really wonderful reporting and without really passionate media personnel like Molly and others like Meg and, and Steph, um, for those of you who know the soccer space, if not, that won't make sense to you, but just really wonderful media people who care about players and who care about athletes and want to share their stories. I, I wouldn't have come forward and I wouldn't have gone on the record so I think the media has a large role to play, not only in supporting athletes, especially those who have faced circumstances similar to mine, but also in holding organizations accountable and creating transparency with some of these um, systems that are operating. So I think the media plays a big role and they might not realize it all the time, but I think their work is super important just even from my own personal experience, because I know that I wouldn't have come forward without really amazing, wonderful media representation. Whew. Again, I, I, I'm, I keep kind of exhaling because I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of going through these moments with you. So again, thank you for, for sharing these sort of moments of reflection um, and just sharing out with others that may be experiencing similar um, instances in their life, because again, your, your lived experience does does really uh, share out and serve as a lesson 
to others and provide encouragement. Um, you know, I want to move into the space of sort of discovery. You've been very candid about the impact of your experience on your mental health, um, on your emotional well-being. Um, and again, um, for those that aren't familiar, just that you talked about the, the verbal abuse, the racist commentary from your coach. Um, but how did this interaction, this exchange um, over time, how did that treatment affect you when we talk about your mental well-being? Yeah, so I'd, I'd consider myself a very mentally tough person. I was a professional athlete. I was a D1 athlete. I played a really, really hard sport for 18 years. Um, I went through some pretty traumatic experiences in my childhood and managed to come out the other side. So I always viewed myself as this very strong pillar of a person that was unbreakable and could get through anything. And so to be put in a situation where I felt like I didn't have control over my life made me feel like I was a kid again and made me feel really vulnerable. And I had never been in the position where I felt like somebody had the power to control my feelings and control my self-esteem. And I'd never thought that somebody would have the power to take joy of one of my favorite things away from me. And yet it happened. And I think, you know, allowing myself to acknowledge that it happened and giving myself the grace to not feel guilty about that happening has been one of the most transformative pieces in my journey and one of the most necessary pieces. Cause again, I don't feel like I would be able to speak about this stuff without crying. If I didn't absolve myself of that guilt of allowing somebody to get under my skin, but you know, being in a position where somebody is telling you constantly that you're not good enough and being in an environment where you're scared to fail constantly and just being in a mental state where you'd rather get hurt than have to even think about facing the next day. Um, it wore on me and it wore on my spirit. And, you know, again, I would consider myself very strong, very resilient, but, um, that was definitely a breaking point for me. And I, I got very depressed. I, I lost friends. I, I didn't talk to people. I lost joy for the sport. I isolated myself. I stopped eating. I withered away physically. Um, so it really was this whole mind, body, spirit, just draining of my vitality and my energy. And I think again, part of my journey to get to where I am now has been recognizing that and letting people help me. Um, you know, I told my mom and my mom was quick to find me somebody who is a perfect match for me as a therapist. And being able to accept help was a, was a very hard hurdle for me to get over having been so independent for most of my life and having had this image of myself as this strong person, um, accepting help was hard, but once I did, and once I allowed myself the grace of healing, I think my life really turned for the better. It turned out <laughs> where I am now. And I think prioritizing my mental health over everything else and prioritizing myself over everything else, over, you know, the sport I had played for 18 years, um, the things that I cared about, I think making sure that I was okay and I was full and I was healed was a really necessary step in my journey of activism because I've been told this lesson by my, my therapist many times, and I'm sure you've heard some variation of it, but you, you're not really able to fill somebody else's cup if your own cup is, is empty. So I had to make sure that my cup was full of water so I could, I could give it then to others. You know, uh, really, after you said all of that, it just connected with me and some of my story. Uh, I know for me, I went through a lot of trauma as well. And I didn't realize it until it was over, but I was depressed for a, almost a year. And, you know, different things uh, took me in and out of friendships, relationships with just people that I knew. And for me, it was 
everything that everything that was happening, I it was happening so quick that I wasn't able to, you know, really grasp the significance of everything that was going on. It just kept it. It felt like things were just piling up, and I had no choice but to continue to take baby steps forward. And you know, that segues into this next question. You know, um, you know, many say athletes should be strong in mind and body, and recognizing that you know we are going through these mental health and you know illness challenges how did this affect your play and performance and the time that was spent outside of the realm of sport yeah I think and I'm sorry you had to go through that I I've definitely been there and thanks for sharing um I think that any time that your mental health is struggling especially as an athlete it's seen as a weakness you know because we're we're designed to be able to get through any sort of hard condition and play through the pain, whether that's physical, whether that's mental or whether that's fitness conditioning, you, you always work through pain. And so I think a lot of the conditioning that you get as an athlete is that you have to always be mentally tough and any sign of weakness is something that should be shamed and overcoming that. And a lot of the guilt that was associated with you know, I'm not okay with what is happening to me right now um, was a big step. But being in a situation like that, that was just so draining. It took away from my performance. I, you know, I thought I was a pretty good player in, in college. I don't know if you guys saw that highlight tape. I had some, some pretty good moves, but I, once the joy drained out of me, I didn't enjoy the sport as much. My skill dropped. I wasn't as energized. Um, training became a chore for me. It wasn't something that I, I wanted to do anymore. And not only that off the soccer field, it felt like I was just functioning as a robot. I was just doing what was necessary to get me through the next day. So I would get home, I would shower, I would eat because I knew that I had to eat because I had to fuel. And then I would literally lay in bed for like eight hours and just watch Netflix and what felt like wither away. And I think, you know, looking back now, I can recognize that I was not okay mentally, but in the moment I was just trying to, again, get through the next day and cope in the ways that I had learned throughout my life. Um, so it was, it was, it was a drain and I'm not going to lie to you. When I came back home after Germany, it took a while to get myself out of that funk. I had to remind myself to go outside and <laughs> start participating in activities that I liked and take walks and start reading again, which is something that I loved as a kid. Um, I had to remember to eat the foods that I liked and to find joy in little activities again, because the joy felt like it was siphoned out of soccer. And then it was simultaneously just siphoned out of the rest of my life. So I really think that, it, like I said, it affected my entire mind, body, spirit. I was physically not well. I was mentally not well. And spiritually, I was drained. I'm telling you, it all sounds so similar to my story. Uh, literally, I remember just so many hours just spent trying to feel better and um, dealing with all of the day-to-day -day actions that I had to continue to go through. You know, for me, the one thing that really clicked and resonated with me was, you know, my friends. Uh, I really found joy and refuge in their presence, in practice, after practice, you know, everything, just being around people that are like me and going through things. And uh, for me, that's what really kind of got me through until I had my breaking point until, I guess you could say I had found a new version of me and which is exactly what happened. So what, is, what advice would you share with young ath athletes and maybe even athletes that are in their prime right now about health management and uh, being able to address mental health and wellness currently? Oh, this sounds so cliche, but it's okay to not be okay. And I really think that we're not told that enough as people. We're not told that enough as young athletes, especially if you're on that pipeline to getting a Division One scholarship. You know, you your whole life is dedicated to getting a scholarship, making the team. And when you're on the team, making a starting spot, keeping your spot, starting spot, making sure your scholarship stays. Um, so I feel like we never really have the space or the grace to reflect 
on how we're doing. It's all for me, at least it felt like it was all just coping and how do I stay in my best condition, um, physically so that I can perform physically. And I guess my advice is to just reflect with yourself and whatever, and whatever the way that may be, like, maybe for you, that's meditation. I do not like to meditate. I'm bad at it. Maybe that's yoga for somebody. I also don't like yoga. I'm not very flexible, but for me, I was able to find strategies that allowed me to reflect on my own space and something that didn't happen until I was 22 was, um, engaging with my own spirituality. I was really cut off from it. And that was something that brought me a lot of peace and allowed me to connect to my mental health. So I think finding something that you can use as an athlete, as an outlet to support your journey and then giving yourself, I I keep using this word and maybe it's because my therapist makes me use it a lot for myself is just giving yourself the grace to be, be not okay. And, um, again, as an athlete, that's very difficult and that takes a lot of unlearning and it's not going to happen overnight. Again, I think I'm very lucky to be able to have come to this conclusion at the ripe age of 23. I think a lot of people, even outside of sports struggle with giving themselves the grace to take care of themselves mentally. You know, that's even reflected in our society, how, we don't have mental health days in a lot of spaces. Being mentally sick is just as bad, if not worse, as being physically sick. And so I think my advice is just to um, self-reflect and find support when you need it and give yourself the peace to be able to take care of yourself. Thank you. You know, that, that, that notion of, of self-care, of mental health self-care is, is so important. And I know this, this confluence of, of COVID-19 and, and even the Black Lives Matter movement for those of us that live at those intersections has really raised that to the fore of we need to take care of ourselves. And I definitely need to do better um, as well. But I appreciate you sharing out, you know, your tips, your sort of best practices, because each of us has to sort of find those spaces. And I also really appreciate the fact that you shared, hey, I got help. I have a therapist. And to recognize that, you know, even at this campus, we have those services available and we have those therapists that are also therapists of color to be able to support us in these spaces. As you sort of think about that, and, you know, we also understand you're still doing activism. And so I want to kind of move us into this space of your your activist journey and that action, knowing all that you've been through, knowing how it has weighed, you know, heavy um, on you for, um, you know, specifically. So I want to go into this, this last segment and share with our audience a little bit about what you've been doing, um, maybe where it all started, and then go into this conversation and learn more about your activist journey to share out with our, um, our, our amazing folks that showed up with us today. So I want to give a shout out to all of those in the audience, um, our peers, our colleagues, our friends, our teammates, um, here at, at San Jose State University and our family and friends. So I'm going to move to that next. I almost like panicked. I was like, I have to do something. Like, and so I texted my coach, Amanda, and I was like, hey, like, I have something like really important to talk to you in terms of like what's happening with um, kneeling for the national anthem. She's like, okay, cool. We'll meet tomorrow. obviously has been in social media and in the news for a long time for me it's just I have a platform where I can speak up about it and so why wouldn't I it's almost like I feel obligated to I feel this like and specifically with the kneeling movement I just I felt like a calling for it she asked me like how would I how would I feel about her kneeling she she got to a point where she really felt like she couldn't um, not do it any longer and so we had a, a discussion with the staff uh, first, just so I let them know kind of what Kaya was thinking, and then uh, then we met with the whole team and just said, "This is this is uh, obviously out there. This is a, this is something that we want to support Kaya in, and if anyone else wants to take part, there, you know, we just explained kind of what we we thought might be a good thing to do as a team, and how do we show solidarity for the cause of racial justice and uh, racial equality, and um, and I think that it was really re well received 
um, in the team. It was really cool because the very first time we kneeled, we all kneeled together, and then those who wanted to stand up then stood up after. It was really cool. I remember in the locker room before we went out and actually did it, I was, I just like thanked my team and I broke out in tears. I'm such an emotional person, so that's not really abnormal, but I broke out in tears and I was just so overwhelmed by like the amount of support and love that I got from them. Just because it, it's not that I wasn't expecting it, but it was just, it was good to be affirmed and to feel so supported in that context. It, it's like a just one big family, you know, like we care about them, like they're my sister, and you know, I'm gonna support you no matter what. Um, and she believes in something that she's passionate about, and we're, we're right there with her. Our sports supervisor, Christina, she came in before our game and talked to us about it, about how proud the athletic department was of us. I don't think I was necessarily as worried about backlash as I would be if I went to a more conservative school. This year we've kind of seen some, you know, people are criticizing us, but then people are praising us. So like it's, there's been more of like this kind of tug, but I think Ty has been consistent in standing up for what she believes in. Um, whenever we do it or whenever I do it, uh, we kneel and we have the person who's like next to you put their hand on your shoulder and just a sense of togetherness as a team. And after every time, I always hug whoever does it, and it's so nice because it's just, it's it's still a continuation of the support that we had at the very beginning. We don't all necessarily have the same beliefs or the same political stance, but we do believe in justice, and we do believe in equality, and those are things that are really important on this team, and, and we do believe in supporting one another, and I've seen um, Kaya be able to express herself a lot more vocally with her teammates and I think it's been great because it hasn't just liberated Kaya, I think it's kind of liberated other players on our team. They know there's so much going on that um, we just can't sit in our bubble. We have to go out in the community and, and try to be uh, agents for change. My mom and I go to a bunch of the women's marches and we went to the March for Our Lives after the Parkland shooting. To those people, to those women, to anybody who is out of place that may not feel like their voice is being heard or being recognized or may not be comfortable speaking up, I say speak up because there are people out there who support you and who are like-minded and who are also trying to make change in the world and it may be easier for us out here in California, but there's definitely a place for their voice to be heard and that keep in a good fight because one day we're going to get there. It may take blood, sweat, tears, it may take time, but we're going to get there one day. So again, another walk down memory lane, but I, I saw this video and it really spoke to me um, and in my role here um, on this campus as the executive director of the Institute, but even more so as a former athlete and as speaking to um, student athletes such as Caleb Simmons here um, in his walk and his journey, but also communicating with coaches, with faculty, with staff that oftentimes want to know, you know, how can I support? You know, I don't live that particular, uh, or I'm not, I'm not Black, I'm not African American, what do I know, what can I do? But it sounds like even from seeing this video that there was some richness. And, and as your coach said, you know, we all don't have the same political views. We all don't come from the same background. But at the end of the day, you know, they understand that inequity is, is real um, in that sense. So with all of that said and the, the multiple messages that were sent throughout this video, um, what, you know, I really want to understand, you know, do you feel... Um, how do you feel you were sort of called into this space of activism? Like we understand, again, that first moment that caused you to kneel, but to know that you've continued this journey, you know, could you explain to us a little bit about sort of um, your activist walk now, now that you've sort of had those seeds planted, gone through some experience, the ups and downs, and you're still walking that path? Could you share with us a little bit about um, your journey in this space now. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really heartwarming. I don't, I don't know the word to describe seeing those videos back when, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but even still, I feel like I look and sounded like a baby compared to where I am now. And I think that just goes to speak on the growth that I've had as an activist and as an athlete and as a human being. Um, 
so why am I still walking this path? I, I still feel so called to it. I feel this deep, deep, intrinsic sense of justice and right and wrong. And I feel this deep yearning to always speak out when I feel like something is wrong. And, you know, (laughs) a lot of the work that I've done thus far has been guided by my gut. And that sounds so strange, but it really has. If I feel something in the core of my being, similarly, like when I felt compelled to kneel, um, I just get this, this kind of insatiable desire to act and to help. And that manifests best in the space of activism and in social justice. And I think as long as I'm breathing, I will continue to feel that way. I don't see that changing for me anytime soon. I just think that's kind of the core of my being. And, you know, in life, you kind of got to find what makes you happy. And for me, I find joy in helping others and moving the ball forward. Um, I feel like I see things a lot more clearly now that I'm older and I've gotten an education and I continue to educate myself and through my lived experience, I feel this um, just great connection to some of these larger structures. And I know I talked about, you know, my, my journey into my spirituality and I was very disconnected from it um, before last year, but this deep, deep, I don't know, it resonates very deeply. The, the path, the people who walked before me on this path, whether that's an athlete activist, whether that's civil rights activists, whether that's, you know, my ancestors who were brought here to these shores against their will. I, I feel their pain. I feel this collective consciousness of, of human struggle. And I, I, I really do believe it's my duty and everybody's duty to continue to push for equity and equality and change for everybody. So I know that seems kind of like a <laughs> really far out there answer, but I don't know how else to describe it other than this very just intrinsic, deep seated desire to, to inspire change. You know, like you, there's just a sense that, you know, you don't want to allow people or whoever it is to continue to let you know, I call it BS. And my mom, I was raised on literally seeing, you know, not letting anything slide, whether it was something that's, that shouldn't be said, something that's out of line, something completely left field, where whether you feel as though you don't have the right to interject, I was always raised that I should always interject because you never know what someone else is thinking. There's probably three other people in the same room, whatever room that is, that feel the same way as you. So, you know, for me, I understand exactly what you're talking about. I still live that to this day. That's why I'm literally sitting here talking to you. And and Dr. Carter knows. So, you know, in your activism, you stand for anti-racism. Why this issue and why this cause? You know, again, going back to that spirituality, I feel this very deep ancestral connection to the people who came before me. And I feel like a lot of non-Black people might not relate to the the sense of connection that Black Americans especially have with that sort of generational trauma. And I think anti-racism is one of the most, if not the most, pressing issues of our generation. Um, It has, you know, this entire country was founded on racism, on genocide, on colonialism, on the backs of black and brown people. And I think that if we are going to move forward in any sort of way, that root cause needs to be addressed. I think racism is tied into sexism, it's tied into capitalism, it's tied into homophobia, it's tied into transphobia, um, ableism, fat phobia. I mean, the intersections with race are uh, (laughs) immeasurable. And so I really, I think focus on racial justice specifically and anti-racist work, not only because of my personal connection to it and being a black American, but also because I do see these sort of larger, larger structural patterns and see, I see the way that racism influences nearly every other social ill that we have. So 
that's why it's of particular interest to me, um, it's intersection. Uh, and that's not to say I, I don't, you know, dabble in intersectionality. I do. I, I care about a lot of different things, but I think I just see anti-racist work as, you know, a solution or as a step forward for a lot of social progress across the board. You are speaking my language, intersectionality. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Caleb knows all day. <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I got another question for you, but we're going to, um, in, in a couple of questions, going to pivot to some Q&A from our audience. And so we have a number of questions that people want to know from you. So again, if you have additional questions, please feel, to put, feel free to put those in that Q&A. But to your point, Kaya, about this notion of intersectionality, um, want to sort of think a little bit about in your activist journey, in your activist walk, you know, what were some of the challenges or what have been some of the challenges that you faced in that effort? And what role has education supported you? Because I know we, we got into law school, right? So, um, you know, yes, come on, high fives. <laughs> you know, we need to give up the spirit fingers and all of that. Um, the fist in the air. Uh, so people, again, give some, some accolades for that. But what role has education played in sort of supporting you um, through navigating some of those challenges? Or has it? It has it at all? It, oh, it, it definitely been. has. Yeah. It definitely has. I, You know, you look again at this intersectionality issue and you look at the way that racism is ingrained in the U.S. Um, and that goes to our education system. And I did not grow up learning, especially where I grew up, Orange County, California. I did not grow up learning about a lot of the atrocities that Black and Brown Americans have faced throughout our history. And, you know, I grew up celebrating Columbus Day and thinking that that was a totally moral and correct thing. And so I think a lot of my education hasn't been, you know, formal through a school system, but more of my own prerogative and of my own effort to unlearn a lot of the things that we have been indoctrinated with living in an, in a white supremacist society. So I think education is definitely a very key component to where I am now as an activist. Um, you know, even from where I was in that video, even though I agree with almost everything I said, I, I laugh because I'm a much more radicalized version of the girl that was in that video now. And I think a lot of that is through education. And I think one of the most powerful tools in social justice work and especially anti-racism is education and the way that, you know, books and knowledge can liberate people, I think is a really powerful thing. And for me, just being able to explore so many different themes and concepts that I would have never learned without pursuing my own sort of curriculum um, has been a really pivotal step in my journey. I don't remember the other half of the question because I got really fired up about education. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was just speaking to, you know, what challenges um, have you faced along this journey um, and how has, you know, education been used to help you navigate some of those spaces? Yeah, I think I'll speak to something that has happened more recently, even in coming out as a whistleblower for this, you know, Washington spirit situation in my former league that I talked about. Um, you know, you read about these sort of larger systemic happenings of like the silencing of black and brown people and especially of black women or women of color. And like, you know, you can read about it and you can theorize it about it all you want, but then to actually have it happen to you is kind of the most surreal thing that I've experienced in my activist journey so far. Um, the way in which, you know, the, the news media has kind of grabbed some of these stories as more people have come out and talked about very credible um, horrific things that happened to them as well in abuse um, within the sport. And while their stories are incredibly powerful and necessary, it's interesting to see the outrage that came from uh, white women coming forward or non-black women rather coming forward versus the amount of outrage that happened when I came forward. It was as if my voice 
and my truth wasn't enough to spark outrage. And again, it was just kind of this surreal feeling for me. Um, kind of, I, I've, I've seen it happen to other people, but to have it happen to you is a really strange feeling. And it's definitely, I think one of the challenges I've had is making sure that one, I don't say silence or I don't say, I do not stay silent on these issues, but then that, you know, how can I stop myself from being silenced? Like, how do I fight against these systems? Um, and how can I find support to stop myself from being silenced? And that's not on me, but um, it is this, that is definitely a challenge that I'm dealing with now, uh, currently in this moment. So. I think you always hit it on the head. It seems like we've been working together for a while, but <laughs> I'm eating it too strange. So, um, you know, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about some inspirations. I know for me being here on campus, I don't really have to look much further than just walking on campus and seeing the statues of some some pillars in society and people who literally changed this world for the better. I know for me, growing up, I always heard about Dr. Harry Edwards. And when I got to meet him, it was so surreal. And then ever since then, my experience with my activism has really felt more holistic. And it's like that, that full circle moment. So I'm curious for you, who, who was some of your inspiration? Well, obviously, you know, a more modern inspiration is Colin Kaepernick. Um, he is going to go down in history as one of the most influential activists of all time, in my opinion, and I deservedly so. Um, specifically with soccer, Megan Rapino, I, I valued, and it's interesting because that's like one of the only white people who I admire for their anti-racist work, uh, frankly. Um, just her willingness to put herself and her career on the line for black people at a time when it was very, very, very difficult to do that, I think was something that inspired me to find my own voice and leverage my own privilege um, in a similar way. But on a larger scale, I think being a UCLA student athlete specifically and recognizing the weight of that legacy was incredible. And just knowing the history of athlete activists that walked on the same campus that I did, uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Arthur Ashe, like <laughs> Rayford Johnson, like it, the list is literally endless. And I, I think the weight of that and just knowing that I was literally walking in the same footsteps as these people who created and inspired such change in the world, especially for black Americans, really inspired me. And I think empowered me to always stay strong in my truth and always stay empowered with my goals and my vision and my activism. So I have a lot of inspirations, um, but I think that for me was just this, like you said, a full circle moment of just seeing the people who came before me and continuing to walk their path and pave new ones forward for other people, hopefully that come behind me. I'm gonna pivot a little bit into some of our, our amazing guests that have stayed online with us that had some great questions. Uh, and so I'll, I'll start with the first one. We're just gonna popcorn them in for you. Um, and so this one's from Dr. Brown. <laughs> um, interested in knowing, this is a question, is that they are interested in knowing how people in high school reacted to you refusing to take the Pledge of Allegiance and also how the first act of activism impacted your activism later on. And some of this, yeah. Yeah, so people in Orange County, California, a predominantly white, predominantly high income, uh, predominantly Republican, area, literally the birthplace of conservatism, which I wrote a paper on in college, uh, did not like me protesting the national or not the national anthem, the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I even tried to do this in civics class. I even tried to do my bill on removing um, a certain phrase from the Pledge of Allegiance and it got shot down by a large supermajority. So people did not like what, what I was doing. Um, obviously, like I mentioned, I had somebody literally tell me to go back to Africa um, I got in trouble for cursing that guy out in class <laughs> after that incident. So I definitely got some stares. I definitely got some looks, but I think that 
the power that came from that first act of activism or what I consider my first act of activism has inspired me to this day of just standing firm in my power. I, I have seen the impact that standing firm in my truth has had. And so I think being able to reflect on where I've been and where I'm going really allows me to continue on this path because it, it gets heavy sometimes, but, um, to know that I have stood in my power for a long time and it has yet to fail me, I think really informs my activism today. <clears throat> and I'll just follow up with another one from the chat. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Do you think activism is possible for those who might be more introverted? Or do you think those who do activism in interpersonal and private places are helpful? Absolutely. And this is actually a question that kind of got brought up. I just did this uh, panel for celebrating the life and legacy of Rayford Johnson. And even just examining the difference between his activism and say the activism of somebody like Muhammad Ali, one is a, a bit a bridge builder and one is, you know, kind of a, a throat puncher. And I think both forms of activism are very, very valid and very needed. Um, you need people who are going to make noise and who are going to shake the foundations of things, but you also need people who are going to bring allies and who are going to create connections. And so I think introverts, you know, you guys can play a great role in activism. And I hope what you can get out of my journey is that activism doesn't have to be these large, grandiose acts of courage, um, even though, you know, in my life, they may have manifested that way. They don't have to be. It could be something as simple as having a conversation. And again, when I first started kneeling, I had the mindset that if I can, if I can spark a conversation with one person that maybe gets them to think about something a little bit differently, then that is success to me. And I think that once we all start to frame activism in that way, and we see it as drops in a much larger bucket we are all just drops and the acts that we do are all just little drops that then can create this sort of ocean of change that's a really lame metaphor but um <laughs> I, I really do metaphor. Really, Great. yeah <laughs> yes I really do think that small acts are just as important and you know however you choose to leverage your activism is is powerful in and of itself Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like, again, like Caleb said, we've known each other for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been in the same conversations and been in the same space, spaces and reading the same books. So it's great, great to have this conversation. Uh, the next question, again, from another attendee um, is, is some questions that, that uh, were, were in line with the things that we wanted to know as well. But are there any organizations that you feel connected to or that you support? We know that you are, are leading a couple, but could you share out a little bit more of those? Yeah, so I am currently, I actually just got hired on to work for a nonprofit called Common Goal, which is a nonprofit that works in the social justice space for soccer. And I'm helping build out their anti-racist project right now, which is a really, really cool thing. Check out Common Goal. Feel, I love the work that they're doing and I would not be working for them if I didn't. Um, and then I am the chairwoman of Anti-Racist Soccer Club, which is similarly working in the soccer space, specifically with anti-racism work. And it is essentially coalition building and creating essentially what is a DEI, you know, consultation through this 10 point plan that we have, um, 10 points that can help provide a framework for organizations within the soccer space looking to engage in more robust anti-racism work. And then uh, I'm also a co-founder of United College Athletes Association. We're still working on the, that one. Um, it's kind of in a rebuilding phase right now, but essentially it's centered on um, empowering college athletes, unionizing college athletes because college athletes are employees and um, addressing some of the issues that come from the concept of amateurism. Um, I think amateurism is a racial justice issue, especially with regards to the fact that most of the money that the NCAA makes is on the backs of black and brown people. So um, that is free labor. It's definitely a replication of a plantation system. So that's a whole other issue, but those are three organizations that I'm super passionate about and involved with and would love for you to learn more about. 
I agree with you. <laughs> going back to that, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> what was your reaction to Naomi Osaka's experience with the media, and what are your thoughts on mental health in the recent Olympics? Another question in the chat. Um, my reaction to her and actually Simone Biles was very similar, and it was pride and it was relief that they were able to reclaim their own mental health and reclaim their own power and you know essentially say f you to all these people who were putting these expectations on them and prioritize their own mental health and you know i related to it i'm not uh some piles or naomi zaka but i i can relate to the pressures of being a black woman in sport and the extra scrutiny that comes with not only being a woman athlete, but also being a black woman athlete in the intersections of that. And so I think that them, you know, taking that space for their mental health was an absolutely radical act. And I, I can do nothing but, you know, show tremendous pride and appreciation for what they did. I think if I had somebody to look up to like that when I was a young black athlete, I I don't know where I, I, I probably would have struggled a lot less with my own mental health journey. So I, I'm just incredibly inspired by them. Thank you. I'm inspired by them as well. And, you know, had a great opportunity over those two weeks of the Olympics to be able to sort of field some questions regarding their experience. So um, I, I was glad to lend a voice, but very, like you said, proud to have them speak up for themselves and, and be a representative and, and, and hold court in many ways um, to, to their truth and their reality of what they were experiencing. But we have a couple minutes left. So we have a couple last questions that I want to um, ask uh, of you. And um, one of that is, again, through this effort, through your activist journey, um, you know, do you have a mentor? I focus on mentoring a lot uh, in my research, but do you have a mentor that supports you in this journey? And how does or might a mentor be a benefit to you and perhaps others that are trying to step into this space? I think the really cool part about my path to activism has been how many mentors I have had. It would be remiss of me to say that I did this alone because I had the support of my family. I had the support of my friends, my teammates, my coaches. I've met so many wonderful people who have such like a breadth of knowledge, a breadth of knowledge um, and being able to draw from them and their experiences and their education and their knowledge has been paramount to where I am now. And so I, I wouldn't say I have one specific mentor. I think I really have this network of people that support me unconditionally and just want to see me succeed and I think you know for everybody that goes for everybody everybody should find people who are in their corner who unconditionally support them and who want them to succeed and again this goes back to the ask for help you don't know what you don't know I'm you know I'm 23 I, there are people who have dedicated their entire lives to some of these things that we're talking about and being able to draw from their experience if they're willing is one of the most amazing opportunities you can take. And so everybody can benefit from a mentor, whether you're in or out of this activist space. Um, I, I'm just lucky to have many. You know, when you talk about mentors, you're looking at one of mine, uh, Dr. Carter Francis. I know for me, not only did she, you know, I was so passionate about everything that I was wanting to get involved in and would later get involved in, but she really like educated me on every single step of the way, what books to read, what movies to watch, what videos to look at, and how, literally gave me an entire PowerPoint of just knowledge and education that's literally ingrained in my mind that I could I could lecture some kind of a class with somebody right now tomorrow. Enough, 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 enough. I'm <laughs> happy, I love it. <laughs> I, I can't make this up, but today, how can athletes continue to be a beacon for change? Um, you know, this is something that a lot of athletes don't like to hear, but I don't think we as a profession are doing enough. I think 
sports is one of the most powerful tools for social change on the planet. It is one of the most universal experiences that we share as human beings. And I think that leverages athletes as these very powerful forces, whether or not they want to be, you know, role models, they are. And I think that it is up to us as athletes, or I guess not us because I'm not an athlete anymore, but it is up to athletes to be able to always an athlete. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, fine. I'll give myself credit. I think it's up to athletes to move the ball forward. And I think that athletes just need to do more. And what that looks like for you personally, I don't have the answers for. For me, that looks like kneeling. That looks like starting sports organizations that help impact anti-racism. It means community building, community outreach. But for somebody else that may be having conversations with teammates, it may be creating, um, you know, initiatives on their own teams or in their communities or on their campuses. It may be fan engagement. I can't answer that specifically how to get involved, but I think no matter what shape or form it takes, you need to get involved as athletes and, you know, pick something that brings you joy and brings you um, just a fire in your belly, something that's worth fighting for. Pick something, pick a cause and, and use your position as an athlete and use your privilege as an athlete to fight for it. Thank you. You, you've left us with a wealth of understanding of experience and of knowledge. And so as we begin to leave this platform today, I want to say first and foremost, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, that experience and and, and your life with us in these few moments. So we just have a final question for you. And it's really wanting to understand, you know, what are next steps for you? And not only what are next steps for you, but what message do you want to leave for us or final words would you like to leave with us tonight? Uh, what's next? I, I think I kind of reflected on this earlier. I'm never really quite sure um, the path that I'm taking. I specifically, like the specifics of the path. I If I, if I would have looked a year ago and been like, today you're giving a speaking event for this wonderful conference, I wouldn't have, I again, not on my bingo card, but I think what's next for me is law school. I'm in the process of applying. Um, I really want to have a degree to back up a lot of the stuff that I'm saying. And so I can, you know, be that much more educated on the issues that I care about. Um, I want to continue working in the social justice space, whether that's for a nonprofit, whether that's working in the sports world, whether that's in prison abolition, I'm not sure yet. I, I would just want to continue to move the ball forward And I want to continue to practice activism and bring people along with me for the journey. Um, Final message for people is, I think I kind of touched on it before, but we all have the ability to be an activist. I think that doesn't have to be this large, scary word, activism. I think activism is in your everyday actions. It's in your treatment of other people it's in your unlearning your own personal journey your own mental health journey is activism for me radical self-care was activism because it then allowed me to be able to help others and so I think you know we can all be better served practicing activism in our daily lives and I think if we all could do that and we all could have a little bit more empathy for the people around us and for the world that we're living in, I think we're going to be okay. And not only okay, we're going to be great. Um, so I, I haven't lost my, uh, my optimism quite yet. Maybe that'll change in 10 years. I don't know. But I, I think everybody who's listening should keep theirs as well, because there's definitely a lot of room for progress. You know, Kai, it's been such a I don't know, enlightening to hear you speak and you know I'm proud of you everything you've been able to do and accomplish so far it it motivates me and it's really tumbling to meet you so thank you for sharing this space with me it was a wonderful opportunity to literally just I guess embrace what you've done and uh hear this on the back end it's been really wonderful so thank you thank you thanks for sharing your story with me thank you both of you 
Thank you. Yes. And, and I definitely like to say, you know, thank you to you for again, sharing with us telling us your story and you know for those out in the audience and I know this is being recorded and will be shared as well but for continuing to be an inspiration um, and just continuing to live that life and be that example for our our, our men and our women our, our boys and our girls those in our spectrum as we know um, for for biracial girls for black girls um, for my little girl who's down who's downstairs right now watching TV I thank you for that. Um, and for definitely living your truth. So um, on behalf of the, the Institute for the Study of Sports, Society, and Social Change, um, I say thank you. Um, and I look forward to staying engaged with you and following you in your activist journey. With that said, I know we're going to um, cut to Jamal Williams for some parting uh, words and some closing to definitely stay engaged in our Transforming Communities series for the, this week and next. I just have to say uh, thank you to everybody, those of you who joined, those of you who, <clears throat> those of you who are listening, um, those of you out there participating in this event, but definitely a big thank you to Caleb Simmons, Dr. Akila carter Francique, and our guest tonight, Ms. Kaya McCullough. I, I have to say I am uh, just, excited to have been able to hear you talk, to hear about your journey. Um, and I'm inspired. I, I, I am leaving this space inspired. And, and, and as a father of two young girls, one who's two years old crying because she didn't want to go to sleep, the other who's five and is thinking about bath time right now, um, I would be immensely proud to have um, my daughter's Carry, uh, walk down the path that you, you that, that you have walked for yourself. And I know it'll be different, but with the conviction, uh, the resilience, um, and just the, the willingness to sacrifice and, and work on behalf of your, your, your community, um, it's inspiring. And, and, and I thank you. And I look forward to hearing about what's next um, for you. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. I invite you all to continue in our programming uh, for Transforming Communities a movement to racial justice. We have, I think, 10 more days left. Please look at the schedule I put in the chat. We have some wonderful programs um, and I, we, we invite you all to, to, to take full advantage of it. I want to share with you um, to make sure that you all know, Dr. Akila carter Francis is the executive director of our Institute for Sports Society and Social Change. <clears throat> and we invite you to get involved more with the Institute, uh, sgsu.edu slash words to action. Um, you can donate, you can learn, you can, you, can, you can visit, you can get involved, and we invite that for you. Um, so on behalf of everybody involved, everybody who all put this event together, and again, our wonderful speaker, Kai McCullough, I thank you all and say good night. <laughs>